Thank you so much. And we are going to move to the next speaker uh, from the industry. Uh, it's an industry lecture. Um, it's from Philips, a uh, well known vendor. Um, it uh, will be presented by uh, Dr. Mark Wen uh, Kutari. Um, uh, he's the director of the clinical science. Welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Mark van Kautem. I'm indeed the Director of Clinical Science in this part of the world and actively mostly here in, in this country, which is important because I had to make a choice for what I will present in the 20 minutes here. Uh, and it means that the choice is that I will focus on some recent advancements that we have developed here in this country and in non-contrast enhanced uh, MR angiography. It also means that unfortunately I will cannot talk uh, about the post-processing, about the, the reconstruction, and mainly the AI reconstruction. <coughs> of course, uh, thanks to the, the sparsity of, of MRA data, typical sparsity of MRA data, we can get fantastic results, and it's not uncommon now to get 0 .0, uh, millimeter cube isotropic images in, in the heart of a TOF MRA, or this is contrast enhanced, of course, uh, um, three phases within one breath hold of 14 seconds with accelerations factors of 15 all become possible, uh, basically because compressed sensing is still at, at the heart of the reconstruction uh, engine that we are using. Anyway, I will focus on, on non-contrast enhanced uh, for different uh, reasons, and, and this has already been shown by other speakers, so I can be very quick. Uh, uh, we all know about the gadolinium deposition. I didn't mention NSF because it's indeed very, very rare. But also, a workflow is affected. Uh, you, need, you need more personnel, you need more acquisition time. You also need contrast agents, of course, so you need more money. Um, and we all know what the role of economics is nowadays in, a, in our hospital. And also, maybe more than anything else, some people don't really like the injection. And it's not just the small kids who are not really looking forward to getting injected, but also the really big boys that we have in this country here don't seem to appreciate getting pricked. But in non-contrast enhanced, of course, it exists, and it exists already for a very long time, and, and time of flight and, and phase contrast, again, also shown by previous speakers, have been available from the very early days. Uh, other non-contrast enhanced MRA techniques were pioneered, uh, amongst others, by, by Miyazaki-san here, uh, also John Britton and the group from Stanford, who did the flow-independent MRA as, as one of the first. But we see that uh, the current standard non-contrast and MRA techniques still can do with some improvement and make them more robust, make them easier, make them faster is still certainly clinically needed. So we decided to develop with the team here in Japan uh, a number of non-contrast and non techniques. And I will introduce two of those. The first one is what we call REACT. And REACT uh, is for the body, non-contrast and non MRA from the body. And it, it all started from a mistake, because we wanted to do MPRH, and again, shown by previous speakers, MPRH we want to do because it shows you the IPH, it shows you the, the, the plaque pretty, pretty well. And we, we expect that this kind of image, however, due to the mistake that we, that, that we did, namely setting the inversion time to shortest and not to the proper couple of hundred milliseconds, it turned out that the blood signal was not suppressed and we really had hyperintensity in the blood signal. And if you look at the schematics of, of the sequence, you can relatively easily understand what go, what's going on. Uh, th this is an MPRH with typically long shot interval, long uh, TI, so you acquired the, the data here. And if you look at the inversion recovery signals of blood muscle and, and fat, you see that the blood is minimized. Fat muscle is pretty high signal. However, if you move to the shortest TI, uh, you get close to the, the, the null point for blood, or you minimize blood, and of course, once we had that first image, we started optimizing for it. Uh, uh, we, we chose the TI so that the fat muscle signal is, is zero, uh, and further introduced some fine tuning by introducing a T2 preparation pulse, uh, also then uh, taken, uh, using the, the longer T2 of blood compared to fat and muscle, so that we have a pretty good contrast between blood and uh, an almost zeroing of the fat and muscle signal. And we get these kind of signals and these kind of images. And this is a very nice example of serendipity. Uh, uh, we thought we made a mistake. 
but maybe a lesson for young researchers and also the older researchers. If, if, you, if you get images that you don't understand, if you get the results that you think, oh, what is this? Don't throw it away. Think twice. Look at it again, and maybe this is the beginning of a new invention. Now, REACT was it. Uh, REACT stands for Relaxation Enhanced Angiography without contrast and triggering. So it's not only just without contrast, it's also without triggering. Uh, you don't need physiological synchronization, neither cardiac nor respiratory. Uh, it can be used for vascular imaging in various body parts mm, and consist, consists, as I already showed, the magnetization preparation using T2 prep and the non-selective IR pulse, but it's also acquired with and Dixon. And that's also important, and I will show you later why that is important. Uh, some quick comparison. I don't really have the time to go through all the details, uh, but if you look at a typical TOF and then uh, balanced steady state free precession techniques and then the REACT, you see that in TOF uh, the, the reverse flow obviously is not visualized very well uh, with balanced sequences, especially if you go to a larger field of view, you get the bending artifacts. And in the REACT, uh, that's pretty free of, of all these artifacts. Note, by the way, there is no arterial selectivity. Uh, you, you, you do image arter arteries and veins. You can do it in many body parts, and just, just a quick show. Uh, this is neck, chest, abdomen. This is two stations, by the way. It's, it is big field of view, but this is two stations. Extremities, and here I show a hand, but you can do it in the foot, uh, you can do it in the arm, you can do it in the leg, you can do it in legs, and also whole body. And this is obviously also a, a multi station acquisition, four stations, I think it was in this case. Some clinical examples uh, we did this with a patient with thoracic outlet syndrome, and as you can see in, in the neutral arm position, uh, all arteries, all veins seem to be really clear. Uh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, however, if you go to the arm abduction or the, the bonsai position, as we call it here, uh, you, you can see that there is some compression here of the vein, probably due to bones and ligaments in, in the area. So uh, we can see what the cause is of the thoracic outlet syndrome. The acquisition time, by the way, was about three minutes each for both images. <coughs> Another clinical example is uh, in children, and we use this a lot in pediatric applications. And this is a 12-year-old uh, female with a vascular malformation. Uh, contrast enhanced MRA was first used and shows the vascular malformation uh, quite clearly there. However, when you use REACT, uh, it shows the detailed reconstruction of the venous malformation extending from the shoulder all the way down to the wrist better uh, compared with contrast enhanced MRA. Now we can do one step further, okay. and as we got the feedback from a research partner, and for reasons that became clear from previous presentations, that it would be a good idea to do REACT and MPRH at the same time, because then you have information about flow stenosis and plaque IPH and so on in, in, in a short time. Now they wanted us to do that in a short scan time, but we can actually do better. We can simultaneously acquire MPRH and uh, react because if you look at this is react now this is schematics of react and uh, you have a short ti here you measure in in the beginning of the inversion recovery here which means that if you want to do an, an mp rage which has quite long ti you do have the space to do that you have the time to do that so react and mp rage can be perfectly combined so in one acquisition in the same scan time as you do the react, you can also acquire MPRH images. And you get this, this uh, you get the non-contrast MRA, and you get the dark blood fat set MPRH. And of course, they're, they're, they're registered. They're automatically, completely co-registered. You don't have to worry about misregistration. A few clinical examples again, uh, carotid plaques here. Uh, first of all, you, you see the, the rather extended field of view that, that you can look. Uh, maybe this is Circle of Willis, Arctic Arch, as mentioned by the previous speaker. Uh, you see, first of all, the MRA, and then with the MPRH, you can see the, the plaques. You can easily detect the plaques, and this, this may be an indication of, of the IPH, uh, of the, the volume of the plaques. Uh, another example here, this is an occlusion of the subclavian artery. 
So in the MPRH, you see the, the occlusion, you see the plaque there, and in the MRA, yeah, you see no flow. Uh, uh, it is completely occluded. And all again, a uh, pretty big field of view that you can acquire with, with this technique. And again, one step further, because you have M. Dixon uh, acquisition. So the M. Dixon acquisition helps you, of course, to, to compensate for B0 uh, homogeneities, for instance. But it also uh, helps you in suppressing the FET signal much better than, than other sequences. And it can give you more uh, quantitative measurements. It can give you the FET fraction for what it's worth. We don't know that, whether that's clinically of value but uh, also a T2 star or an R2 star, whatever you want, a uh, map can, can easily be done based on the M. Dixon. And on top of that, because we acquired two data points on the inversion recovery uh, of the blood, muscle, and, and uh, um, fat signals, we can also acquire T1 estimates. I wouldn't dare say that these are T1 measurements because we only use two data points, but we can, we can make a fairly good T1 estimate. And the jury is out, of course, now whether this is clinically good enough. Uh, we have T1, you have T2 star, you have MRA, you have MPRH, and all in one go, <coughs> all in one acquisition of about four minutes. Okay, uh, let me switch gears now and uh, go to the brain, because there too, again, I'm not saying anything new here to this audience, and, uh, in neurovas for neurovascular diseases, of course, you, you, you have the vessel wall imaging. Plenty of attention already in, in this session to that. Uh, we have the, the MRA, mostly POF. You have the dynamic uh, MRA. And clinical usefulness of these techniques has, has been amply established, of course. However, there are still some, some challenges. And there is the challenge of the, the slow flow. There is the challenge of retrograde flow. Uh, uh, there is the challenge of random flow collateral flow, sometimes peripheral flow, and territorial flow. Uh, can, can we see that, can we observe that with non-contrast announced uh, MRA techniques? Most of the time we can't, and we still have to do either contrast enhanced MRA or uh, another modality even, uh, CTA and DSA. So our goal was to try and find techniques where we can, we can get this kind of information using non-contrast enhanced MRA techniques. And those techniques are what we call ACASL, 4 d PEC, and uh, 4 d SPEC, all based on enhanced uh, ESL techniques. So first of all, uh, ACASL, 4D, uh, 3D, sorry, 3D, high resolution uh, static MRA. What is the idea here? <coughs> Um, the gradient design of the label here is optimized such that we have a selective labeling of accelerated spins. Mm -hmm. So not static spins, not velocity, uh, not, not moving spins with constant velocity, but spins moving with an acceleration component. We do on-target labeling, of course, you can see here. And because it's on-target labeling, uh, it does not depend on inflow, obviously. Therefore, it's sensitive to slow flow and also retrograde flow. So it may solve two things in, in one go. A little bit about this artery selective, uh, basically acceleration selective uh, gradient design. Why did we do acceleration selective gradient design? Because we know of the existence of velocity selective labeling, and, and other speakers will talk about this later in, in the today, I think. Uh, where you um, have a, a zero, first zero moment. Hmm? So therefore, you can label arterial, everything that flows, arterial flow and venous flow. When you use that as a label, you get images like this. But you see uh, you have an overlap of the cortical veins and the cortical arteries, and that can hamper the diagnosis that the doctors want to make. If you move to a first order flow compensation, hmm? also the first moment is then nilled you will basically see that the venous flow, uh, which is mostly constant, does not have an acceleration component, uh, will not be labeled, while the arterial flow, which clearly has a pulsatile component, uh, will be labeled. And you move from images that you see here to here, and 
and you see that the signal from the cortical vein is completely gone. You still get some, some uh, signal from the big uh, central sinus uh, vein here, but the cortical veins, which are uh, critically important for the diagnosis, and to make sure that you can distinguish between arteries and, and veins, they're completely gone. So we use this uh, for a couple of patients. This is a Moya Moya disease, uh, 25 years old. And normally you can never visualize uh, head foot flow. Uh, you can, you can uh, fl measure the flow going from feet to head, but not head to foot. Uh, but it's there. We know that from DSA. We get this uh, collateral flow, in this case, in leptomeningeal anastomosis, beautiful word. Uh, as you can see here with the blue arrows and the DSA, it's clearly seen. If you do a normal TOF, nothing to be seen. Eh? It is as if there is no blood flowing there. However, if you use ACASL, eh, uh, on target labeling, you can visualize this collateral flow very, very well. And that's important, clinically important, to judge the risk of ischemia. Another example is an AVM. Uh, when you look at an AVM, you want to know where the feeding arteries are, where the nizes is, and whether, where the draining veins are. And they are not consistently visualized. Uh, on the DSA, yes, uh, you see the feeding artery, you see the nidus, you see the draining vein. But on the TOF, no. Uh, you will not be able to see that. If you do ACASL, you can very well visualize feeding artery, the nidus, <coughs> and also the draining vein. Now you may say, you just told us that vein is not visualized because it doesn't have a pulse style component, but in this case we're a bit lucky here because draining veins typically have pulse style flow too, so they are visualized statistically. Next technique is 4 pack This is for dynamic MRA. Uh, and it's based on PCASL uh, labeling. And then we do centra keyhole and view sharing. Uh, as you can see here, it's all a bit complicated. I cannot go into details to accelerate the sequences. But the important is that you move from a star labeling to a PCAS labeling, and you move from multiple acquisitions per label to a single acquisition per label, and those two together will give you a much higher SNR. And we use a changing label duration for dynamic information. And this is what it looks like. This is the DSA of the patient. And you see then, oops, not coming. Um, this is the conventional MRA with the star. And you see that, especially at the late arrival, the peripheral signal is pretty, pretty low, and you cannot really see it very well. Uh, if you compare that to the 4D pack, you see that you have full visualization comparable to the DSA, even of the collateral flow of the late arrival spins. And again, that's important to judge the risk of ischemia. Uh, this is a fistula, uh, dural arteriovenous fistula. Again, what is important is to see what are uh, the feeding arteries, where is the draining vein, and most importantly, whether there is cortical venous reflux. Uh, in DSA, you can see all that. Uh, uh, with 4D-PEC, you can also now see that, and you can check that from the timing. You can also see it on the, the static later on. You can, of course, use those images together to see that this is clearly the feeding artery, the nidus, and then the cortical venous reflex can be seen. And that's, again, very important uh, for the uh, clinical management. And the score of, of accuracy with DSA as gold standard is 100% actually. And then finally, uh, vessel selective uh, 4D-PEC. Uh, as it said, it's the 4D-PEC I just showed you, but now we can also select which vessel we want to see the domain from by adding uh, some gradients perpendicular to the, uh, the, the labeling slab. Uh, we can put uh, on the EC, the external carotid artery, or the internal, and then we can see the flow domain of the internal and the external carotid artery completely separately. Again, this is completely non-invasive, just using label. No contrast, uh, and no contrast agent is being used. And this is what it looks like for a patient, with, uh, again with the DAVF. So super selective B castle is, is used for the right ECA, for the left ECA. And you can see that all the arteries uh, that you can visualize <coughs> on the DSA can also be seen on the 4D pack, left and right. And there is a complete uh, correspondence between DC, DSA results and our results with for the SPEC. 
So in short, uh, uh, in this presentation, I quickly <laughs> introduced two new approaches in non-contrast enhanced MR in geography. All of it co-created by Philips Clinical Scientists with our <coughs> customers and, and research partners here in Japan. First of all, REACT and its, its variants to address clinical needs of MRA in the body. And then ECASL 40PEC, 40SPEC to address clinical needs in neuro-MRA with the aim of supplementing, uh, uh, not taking over from SDA, supplementing for the time being. Uh, but hopefully it will bring additional <laughs> clinical value. And of course, all this needs to be further tested and clinically assessed whether these new techniques bring that actually clinical value. But I'm pretty sure they bring a substantial improvement because they have more flexibility at and at the same time robustness to clinical non-CE MRA acquisitions. And I just want to point out that we continue to develop uh, other non-CE MRA techniques uh, like time-resolved travel or um, coronary angiography based on, on balance sequences with M. Dixon acquisition. But clearly, I, I do not have the time to, to discuss all that. So with this, I would like to thank you for your audience and hopefully our big boys will be happy with our techniques. And I thank you for your attention.